Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. This episode features William Green. If you don't know who William Green is, I uh, encourage you to, well, I encourage you to listen to this episode no matter what. But William is someone who I met at a uh, unique time in life. I'm pretty sure it was the same weekend that I spoke to Mario Gabelli. I saw William at the Markel Sunday brunch get together at Berkshire, asked him if he would grab lunch with me. And we spoke so long, I almost missed my plane. And in that conversation, I saw a really unique person. And I hope that this conversation gets the world to see who he is in a similar light that I got to see that time. I think, you know, everybody now knows William as a fantastic author and a great podcast host, but I think this episode may highlight who he is as a man. And it's one that I am fortunate to be able to feature. And I just really appreciate him as a person. He's one of those people that I'm, I'm really fortunate to have in my life. And I, I hope that you all enjoy this episode very much. And also, buy his book, Richer, Wiser, Happier. We're coming after Morgan Housel numbers, and uh, we need your help. So this episode is sponsored by Bastier Partners, a boutique investment banking firm offering securities through Hollister Associates, LLC. Bastier Partners is a new breed of investment and merchant bank that specializes in primaries, secondaries, and co-investment opportunities in the private markets catering to a unique coverage universe of 250 plus family offices, venture capitalists, and crossover hedge funds. While sector generalists, the firm specializes in fast-growing technology and technology-enabled businesses, advising companies on primary capital raises and creating liquidity events for founders and early investors via secondary transactions. The firm also advises fundless sponsors and GPs on co-investment opportunities. Bastier Partners was founded nearly a decade ago by Nader Afshar, a former senior investment banker at J.P. Morgan, and his headquarters in Los Angeles. Securities offered by Hollister Associates, LLC, member FINRA and SIPC, Bastier Partners and Hollister Associates, LLC are not affiliated companies. I hope you enjoy this conversation. I hope you check out Bastier Partners. Nader has been a great friend and has supported the pod because he enjoys what we're doing here and he is a member of the business brew community for lack of a better term and uh, he's been a great guy to get to know and if any of the words that i just read resonate with you at least check out his website he's a great guy and uh he's worth a call as always none of this is financial advice all of the information contained in this program is for entertainment purposes only please consult your financial advisor before making investment decisions and do your own due diligence P.S. If you've heard kids screaming in the background during this read, I assure you they are happy and no kids were harmed recording this. Excited to be joined by William Green. I'm just going to, we're jumping into the conversation, so uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, William, we were just talking about how we're both tired. Uh, yeah, I think everyone we know is tired. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's that, if it's that we don't give, give ourselves permission ever to stop working these days or if there's no separation between work and home life, or if we're just tired from this sort of pandemic period. I, I don't know, but everyone I know seems to be a little bit weary. It's funny for me, right? 2020 happened. And then I was like, all right, 2021, I'll get back to normal. Uh, well, that didn't happen. And now 2022 isn't exactly starting out anywhere near normal. And, uh, you know, they track like these misery indexes, misery is through the roof. And it's just like, ah, the 2020 is going to deliver any nice years. I feel a little bit guilty because I actually have been pretty cheerful. And, and I think I think part of it is, I mean, tired, but cheerful. And I think part of it is um, that in a, in a sense, for writers, we're used to economic uncertainty and we're used to isolation. And hmm. so in a sense, the period of COVID where suddenly everyone felt this sense of, uncertainty and this sense of isolation that was like my home court <laughs> it was kind of like welcome welcome to the game this is where i've lived for the last 25 30 years and so in some strange way i think i i i, I 
also in a very strange way, it became less isolated for me because my wife stopped going into the office and started working at home, which was kind of lovely. So I had company. And then for nice. a while, my kids were home as well. Now, now my son has graduated from college and is um, teaching and my daughter is back at college, but is coming home tomorrow for a few days. And um, so actually, weirdly, while most people were isolated, I thankfully was less isolated than I usually am as a writer. There was a time where I was working on my book a few years ago where I, f- I felt like I was kind of going nuts. And I, I think my, my, my son was at college. My daughter was at high school and was away for the day. And my wife was in New York City at work. And I remember coming into the house and s- saying out loud, do I exist? Or do I not exist? And just thinking, <laughs> oh, Jesus, I'm really in trouble now when I'm speaking out loud. But there was this weird sense of, of just being so isolated inside my head as a writer. And so, so yeah, this is a very self-referential and digressive way of saying, actually, that I, I, I do feel guilty about the fact that I've not been more miserable during this period. I, I've, I've actually been pretty happy. So sorry about that. I apologize. I, I think it's good. I think we need to spread more cheer. Yeah. I, yeah. I encouraged people on uh on the Twitter machine to turn on some earth, wind and fire and dance a little, you know, like just let it out. The other thing about this period is that it gives you permission to say no to a lot of things that you didn't want to do. And so that's been kind of great to be able to say, I'm sorry, I just don't want to expose those people to the risk of me giving them COVID because I've been socializing or something. And so yeah. you duck out of some event that you just really didn't want to go to. So. <laughs> So it really means that I can sit around reading and thinking and um, blathering on all day. Well, that's nice. Yeah. So I don't know. But but you, you've been relatively cheerful since we last spoke or you've been going nuts? No, man. I You know, I don't look on a on a day to day basis. I have nothing but gratitude um, for, you know, I, I, I live a very fortunate life. Um, I You know, there are I think that. I have felt burnt out, if that makes any sense. And I and I've kind of gotten to this weird point in my life where, uh, you know, you know, what's really weird that I'm going through, actually, for the longest time, my identity that I thought I cared about was being a good investor. Mm. And this podcast is actually like way more fulfilling to me than uh returns and some of some of that has to do with um you know i'm watching my grandma age uh and she's declining you know it was slower and now it's faster uh, and I, I don't know it's just put a lot of stuff in in uh perspective and my kids are at this age where you know once the four-year-old turns five i think we're all gonna have really good times together at four <laughs> four is not my favorite age yeah um but I just, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm much less interested in work than I used to be. Oh. Uh, and I, I don't know. I almost feel guilty saying that, but it's the truth. Yeah. I, maybe this period has forced us to reappraise a little bit and say, what is it that actually makes for a happy and successful and fulfilling life? I, I think I probably just had my midlife crisis a few years earlier than you did. And, <laughs> and so well, I, I'm older than you. So, I'll um, tell you what I think. I think what a commonality may be is I I have now had access to investors that I respected for so long and I see how hard they work and I see, you know, how smart they are. And um, I don't know if I really like look in the mirror and say, do I want it as bad as they do? My answer is no. That's very interesting. That's a that's a very helpful piece of self-awareness. And and it may be. It may be that you could structure your investment portfolio so that it would require less intensity. If intensity yeah. is not what you uh, are wired for, maybe that would be smart to structure it in a in a way that suits your your temperament and your 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 drive and ferocity. And I I sometimes think about this because over the years I interviewed people like Peter Lynch who ran like crazy for 13 years, I think, and then quit and um, basically never took a vacation, never took a day off practically and had this belief that he should just turn over as many rocks as possible. That if he looked for 10 ideas, he'd maybe find one good one. And if he looked for 100, he'd maybe find five good ones or whatever it was. And 
then his successor or one of his successors, Jeff Finnick, also worked like crazy, but then quit to spend more time with his kids. And, um, and then Karp, who I wrote about in the epilogue of my book, also regarded himself kind of as a, an extreme athlete, almost the way that he was investing. And, and he was a great squash player and, a, uh, you know, obsessed with fitness and health and nutrition. And so he was kind of trying to outrun everything and then kind of um, just decided he couldn't bear it anymore and quit. And so I sometimes wonder if you, you, can, you can win massively by just working way harder than anyone else, which is sort of what Peter Lynch figured out. He's like, look, I'm competing with so many smart people. If I don't work incredibly hard, um, I'm not going to win. And, and that was the early advice that he gave to Bill Miller Well, but when Bill Miller went to see him in the 80s. And, and Bill said, you know, can you ever slow down? And Peter Lynch was like, no, not really. There are like two gears. Either, the, either you're like full speed ahead or you might as well stop. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't really compete at, at the um, very pinnacle unless you're working really full pelt. And so I think that has kind of impl interesting implications if you don't want to do that. Um, and then you look at these older investors, the Buffets and the Mungas and the like, and they're not, I mean, I mean they clearly work, incre Buffett in particular, I think clearly works incredibly hard. And I, I remember Tom Gaynor saying to me that Buffett has um, incredible stamina. Like they used to sit together on mm. the post board and he said, Buffett just was like the energizer bunny. And he said, that's a physical feat, what Buffett has, so he never stops working. So even there, someone slow and patient seems to have this kind of intensity, this kind of ferocity to the way he works. But I, I think you want to structure things somehow so that it suits your temperament, so that you're a long-term investor. So, you, so that in a sense, you're actually taking advantage of, um, <laughs> of, of your laziness or your lack of, uh, uh, your, your lack of desire to be sort of trading constantly or running around constantly or studying a thousand ideas. And so it may actually be that that's a competitive advantage. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, I don't, I don't know if it is or it isn't. What I do know is that I'm responsible for my pool of capital and other, and I'm not responsible for other people's pool of capital. And, and part of the reason for that is I don't really want the pressure that I feel like accepting outside money would create. And part of it's, I frankly don't know if I deserve to ask people to give me their money, right? Like, um, but I guess I always, I always thought that the goal was to get to the point where I felt like I was ready to ask people for their capital. And now I'm finding out that maybe the goal is to have really fascinating conversations with people that I'm really fascinated with and share that knowledge because uh i don't when we first met i don't know man i felt really lost and i guess for the first time i actually feel like i have a purpose and that i'm giving back to a community that has given me so much right i mean if i was an investor if i wasn't an investor i don't think i'd be interested in the world and like we never would have met and and like there, there are all these fantastic things that i owe to investing um, and this is the way that I can actually get back. And it's, it's, uh, fulfilling. Yeah. And that sense of being lost, I think is actually pretty powerful because I think if you were, if you were really satisfied the ways and you felt like you'd figured it out, you were kind of smug and complacent and you're like, yeah, I've nailed this game of how to live and how to invest and all of that and how to parent and everything else. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have this intense desire to learn and to chat with people and to try to figure things out. And so for me, I think part of, part of what's helped me over the years is, is that in the same way as you, I've kind of, uh, I've gone through these periods where I felt really lost and where, so, so when I'm interviewing people that I write about or that I interview on my podcast, um, I, I have skin in the game when I'm asking them how to think and how to live and, how to invest. Uh, I, that's because I want to know, I want to figure it out. And, and so I think it's interesting when you, when you think of people like Tim Ferriss with his podcast, um, Tim clearly, I, who I've never met personally, but he, he's talked very candidly about having had issues with 
depression and, and abuse and the like. And so there's, there's, he's obviously working through a lot of pain. Tony Robbins, who I know pretty well personally, but not incredibly well, also had an incredibly difficult childhood and um, went through a tremendous amount of pain that he's been very candid about with, you know, being um, physically hurt by his mother and having lots of different stepfathers and um, poverty and no food and the like. And I think, I think it helps to have some degree of pain, angst, and uh, uh, difficulty that you're trying to work through. It drives you to figure these things out. And so, so you have to harness that. I'm fortunate because I had kind of lo- loving parents and in, in some ways was very, very fortunate. But um, I, I've managed to have lots of self-induced, uh, <laughs> self-induced <laughs> crises of, uh, of uh, confidence and, and angst and all of that. So, so, so I have a lot to figure out. And I, so, so, yeah, I think you're kind of harnessing your deep desire to, to learn stuff for yourself and then share it with other people. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, the benefits are incredible. I mean, uh, you know, people always say give to get. And I, I don't know how else to give other than what I'm doing. But it seems to be resonating with people. And, um, you know, it's just rather than like, what can I take from the world? It's what can I give to the world? And it's it's um, I don't know, man, I, I don't know how to describe it, except for I'm just a lot more calm and a lot more at peace with where I am. And my investment returns, uh, especially this past 12 months, maybe <laughs> would argue that uh, I should be paying a little more attention. But I don't think that's actually reality. Um, I, I think where I'm at is actually pretty, pretty OK. It's also with investing, it's a very long game. And so 12 months doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, if you're positioning yourself to succeed over 30, 40, 50 years, why do you care what happened in the last 12 months? Especially if you didn't screw up so much that you're knocked out of the game, then you're absolutely fine. So, you know, paper losses and all of that, who cares? It's, um, I, I think that... There's a really big difference between the way that investing is often covered in the media, which I've been guilty of too, right? Because I've written for Forbes and Fortune and Time and Money and Barron's and all of those places about great investors over the years. And there's there's a sense of this horse race that you've got to beat the market and the stars are the ones who want to beat the market. And that's all very well. And if you're a professional money manager, you have to demonstrate that you've added value in some way. But I think the reality for most of us, much as we would like to beat the market and it's possible to beat the market, although incredibly difficult, the reality for most of us is really you, you just want to build wealth in a resilient and sustainable way over the long term. And so the focus then is completely different. And so things like actually protecting your energy and investing in a way that suits your temperament and investing in a way that's going to enable you to survive these difficult periods so that you'll just stay in the game. That's much more important. Yeah, I, I think that's totally true. Um, you know, I, I can I can imagine why somebody that's dedicating their life to constant outperformance would hear something like this and say that's nonsense. Uh, and and I could understand why they feel that way. Right. But um, I don't know, man, I guess I, I just kind of got to a point where, um, you know, it's, I mean, not to go back to it, but it's a big part of my life right now, but like, I'm, you know, taking care of my grandma and making sure that my kids at at this stage of their life know that they're loved. Um, I'm probably remedying some stuff that I perceive that happened in my childhood. Um, but one of the things that happened in my childhood was my grandma was like the driving reason that I feel like I am okay. And to be able to be with her as she ages and to be the reason that the infrastructure sort of around her exists and that people are taking care of her, like, it's just way more rewarding to me than, you know, did I outperform? Yeah. And I, I think some of it's just like, uh, I've just had some some things go on in my life that sort of reprioritized how I look at the world. What made your grandmother so special? Because I remember hearing you talk about it before in another episode where, where you talked about you had difficulties with your stepmother and the like, and, and the, yeah. your, your grandmother kind of stepped in. Like, what, what made She was just awesome, up? man. Like, um, every, uh, every day for a while, 
um, my my stepmom and I got to a point where she was like, I'm not going to do anything to you for you anymore. Um, and, you know, I that's my version of reality. Her version of reality is probably, well, like I put the food over your head and structure around your life that you didn't have before. So I did a lot. Right. Um, and as I've gotten older, we, we've mended some things. Um, my mom's life for a while was quite chaotic. And uh, I think that, you know, my grandma, when when my dad moved me to Florida, my grandma became my mother figure. And, you know, she lived 25 minutes from me, but she'd drive to pick me up from school every day. And then we'd go play golf every day. And uh, she was just like, she was my homie. You know, I, I mean, I'd, I'd go see her every summer I'd spend with her. And it was just like all, all the great memories in my, uh, from my childhood kind of are with her. So if there's something that you've learned from your grandmother that you'd like to replicate with your own kids, what, what would it be? Um, being there, you know, like physically being there now. You know, I have some beef with how much she was able to emotionally be there, right? Like she had barriers around her and she's dealt with a lot of loss in her life, which probably had something to do with that. But the time together created these quality moments. And I'd I'd like to replicate that. Yeah. That's that's an amazing thing. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe maybe part of becoming a little older is that um it 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 reorients you. So you start thinking that the a lot of the stuff that was going to give you a sense of purpose early on, like I'm going to become so successful that they can't ignore me or so rich or so smart or so educated that everyone's going to be impressed with me. You start to realize how hollow that is at a certain point. I think most of us anyway, e- either you, either you got some of that stuff and you realize that it still didn't make you happy or you didn't get it. And you're like, oh shit, well that didn't work. And so either way, there's some sort of crisis, I think. And, Unless you happen to be someone who um, just that stuff really does work for. I mean, if you're, if, if I, I don't know, I don't want to be judgmental of other people. Maybe it's a sort of shallowness or maybe it's superficiality or maybe it's just you're better adjusted and you can take pleasure in, in things like that. I, I don't know. But, but for me, when I hit about 40, um, I mean, I think we've talked about this before. Part of what happened to me is I got laid off from this incredible job. And so then you start to think, wait a second, so I've worked unbelievably hard for all these years. It's something I was really good at. And I felt like kind of a big shot who would go off and interview, you know, presidents and prime ministers and billionaires and, you know, traveling all over the world. And here I was thinking that was my identity. And um, maybe it was just a way of kind of hiding from other stuff. And so it may be that that stuff gets kind of stripped away. And then you're like, oh, so what am I actually left with? And then you start looking around. You're like, well, I have these two young kids. Because my, my kids, who are now 24 and 21, then were very young. Um, not much older than yours. And so you're like, oh, okay. So I actually get to stay home and take my daughter to school every day or take my son and pick him up from school or what, whatever it would be. And so yeah, it just kind of reorients you and you start to think, oh, maybe that's actually way more important. And like like most great truths, these things are pretty trite, except they they do happen to be true. You get much more satisfaction out of that. But at the same time, you do want to achieve something and you want to feel like your career is meaningful. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um what do you mind telling people a little bit about what your job was? Uh, because I don't know that too many people know that about you. I mean, I don't many may, but I I didn't know until we talked. Oh, sure. So I came to New York in my early 20s. I, so I'd grown up in England and I went to Oxford and studied English literature. And I, then I came to New York and I thought I'd be a, a great writer and would write fiction and write for The New Yorker and stuff like that. And I, I got off to a fast start writing for a lot of great magazines. Um, and I would write book reviews and I'd write long narrative features. And I'd go off to Mississippi and write a seven, eight page story about Byron DeLay Beckwith, who was a white supremacist who killed Medgar Evers, the, the great civil rights leader, and, and was being retried now, having been acquitted by an all white jury in, I guess, the 60s. And so I would write these long narrative literary things. And 
And then, and then I ended up becoming a financial journalist and I fell in love with the stock market. And I went to work for things like Forbes and I wrote for Fortune and um, all sorts of financial publications. And then I went to Asia and lived in Hong Kong to work for Time magazine. Uh, and I became the, initially the deputy editor of the Asian edition of Time and then later the editor, which meant that, you know, I would be sending reporters around India and China and North Korea and Myanmar or Burma as it then was and um, Pakistan and Afghanistan. It was an amazing job. It was an incredibly interesting job and covering things like the tsunami and SARS and avian flu. And the like, it was really fun, really interesting, incredibly demanding. And then I went to London to edit the European, Middle Eastern and African editions of Time. And so I felt like kind of this big shot. I returned to my home city of London on an expat package for time, which was an amazing ruse. So it meant that I was living in a beautiful white stucco house in Belgravia in this beautiful area of London. And my kids were paid to go to, um, uh, were paid for to go to private school. And so it was all kind of this great ruse. This is one of, you know, this still at the tail end of the golden age of, of magazines where Time magazine was still very powerful and getting on the cover of Time was a great thing. And Time was owned by Time Inc., which was, the most powerful um, magazine company in the world, and you know, Sports Illustrated and People and Money and Fortune. It was an amazing powerhouse. But they had done this terrible deal with AOL um, that I, th I think goes down as one of the worst deals in the history of business, where AOL and Time Warner had merged at the pinnacle of the dot-com bubble in 99, 2000, around then. And so they'd never really recovered. So the company became very weak. And then during the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, things really went to hell. And so here I was, one of the most expensive people on staff, um, you know, with my fancy expat package, <laughs> swanning around interviewing people like David Cameron, the British prime minister, and Donald Tusk, who was the Polish leader who then became head of the EU and, um, and feeling very self-important and um, being flown business class everywhere to interview prime ministers and presidents and the like. And then suddenly, ignominiously, when Lehman Brothers went under and, and the financial crisis struck, I got laid off. And so this is probably around October 2008, something like that. Um, and I, I remember calling home and, and telling my wife and my son, who must have been about nine or 10, if I remember rightly, maybe a little older, yeah, probably 11 or 12, projectile vomited across the living room. Uh, I mean, it was really intense. You know, I went from, hmm. I went from feeling like this, this, this golden boy to um, feeling kind of, eh. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to explain because you know it's not personal when these things happen that, uh, you know, everyone tells you it's not personal, but it's intensely personal. If you've, yeah. if you've just been working seven years. I've given my entire life to this yeah. organization. Now you're canning me when I like yeah. need you, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I'd worked sort of 70, 80, 90 hours a week for probably seven years at something that I was weirdly good at, at least in my own estimation. And then suddenly you're canned. And so that, that really forced me. I, I was probably 40 at the time. So that really forced me to go back and think, so is it all just random? Did I just lose this political battle because I didn't smarm up to the right people? Is my profession dead? Because I'd spent all those years in journalism as it declined. And so you're sort of like, is this just going the, the way of horse carriages and buggy whips and all of that? And I just need to change or uh, is it a blessing in disguise? And so it and, you know, am I going to be able to support my kids and, and my wife? And so, and, and, it, and it created all sorts of issues in some ways. It's funny, I've forgotten all of this. So thank you for reminding me of my trauma, Bill. Uh, so, so, <laughs> we can uh, get into mine. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, I'll live to regret asking you about your grandmother. And so, um, so I had, um, so because I had been in New York for all those years, I mean, I'd grown up in London, then I'd been in New York. Then Time Magazine had sent me on an expat package to Hong Kong. And then I'd gone to London on an expat package. And so when I got laid off and I was living in London, it's like, where do I even live? What's my country? Hmm. And 
then do I keep my kids in these fancy private schools in England? My son was at this 700 year old private school in England at some point then. And so initially I went to work. I, I, it was sort of like a rebound relationship. I took a job at one of the few um, media companies that was really thriving. Uh, and I was very lucky to get picked up. And so I got a you know um, severance package and then immediately went to work for this other company. And I just hated it. And I felt like a sort of trapped rat uh, in this cage being tortured. And, and then I quit that job and I started writing books. And so, so, so yeah, for me, I, f- I, feel, I feel sort of slightly guilty when I um, talk about this period as if it was a really big deal because so many people go through so much worse stuff. And then I, I would intimately remind myself of that great line from um, the singer Neil Young who said, my, my problems are so meaningless, but that don't make them go away. And so, so, so uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, um, big whoop. But, but it felt bad at the time. And it, it felt a little bit like a kind of public shaming. Uh, yeah, but the benefit of it partly is that it forces you when you're in sufficient pain and what you're doing isn't working, it forces you to go back to the drawing board. And that for me was a sort of a very, very powerful and beneficial process that really has changed my life over the last, what is it, 13, 14 years. So my life now, thank God, is much better than it was then, but I had to go through this storm to, uh, a very long storm uh, to to get there, and and so maybe like I was saying to you before, when when I was saying that your the, the the fact that things have not always been easy for you is partly what drives you to ask questions and learn stuff that that it turns out to be actually a real gift. Um, I think the fact that I went through this very painful period helped me helped, helped me in many ways. One of them as a writer and interviewer that I think when I'm interviewing people, um, I'm much more empathetic. And I think people trust me and tell me stuff that maybe they wouldn't tell me otherwise. Probably because I'm pretty open about the fact that I went through the ringer myself. Yeah. It, it, it must have been, I mean, that's such a public, uh, it, that's such a public position. And then, you you know, you've got everybody on speed dial pretty much, right? And then, and then you're fired and it's like, well, now what? Uh, that It had to be like a very lonely feeling for, for a little while. Yeah, you do feel, I, it's funny, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a very successful um, investor and, and he, he ran a hedge fund that was successful and he was a eminent professor. And then his hedge fund kind of got ripped apart during the financial crisis. And we talked a lot about his situation and mine. And he talked about his sense of shame. And it's a very strange thing for, I mean, I don't, I don't think many of us said that. Maybe, maybe it's men. We're, we're not that comfortable talking about a sense of shame. Uh, we've Shame's mentioned, powerful stuff, man. Yeah. We've mentioned guilt a few times. Guilt and shame. Um, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I read a lot of David Hawkins' books. Like a lot of people have read Power Versus Force. I, I just finished another of his books this morning, and I, I I read his book pretty obsessively over and over again. And one of the things that he says that was an important lesson for me is that these emotions like shame and guilt, in in his terms, calibrate very low. They're not very helpful. They're kind of destructive emotions. And so, I think what in practical terms, one of the implications of that is that you kind of want to flood the zone with better emotions like uh, love, kindness, compassion, uh, empathy, truthfulness, you know, things like that, um, serving others, sharing, because those things calibrate incredibly high. And if, if your listeners want to go read up on some of this stuff, I, I would start with something like Power Versus Force, which is a very seminal book of his. And you'll get a sense of what we're talking about with this kind of scale of consciousness. Uh, and I have no idea what to make of that scale of consciousness in literal terms. But figuratively, uh, I think this, is, this stuff is very, very powerful to know that things like shame and guilt are not very helpful. And, and, and in some ways, I think part of what we do is we, we, take, we take issues we live with as kids, and, you know, 
parents or teachers or schools or whatever, making us feel guilty or uh, making us feel that we were somehow lacking or that we hadn't come up to scratch. And, and you know, we pr- project them onto God or the universe or other people. And um, so we end up beating ourselves up with guilt and shame as a way to kind of, um, I, I, I guess we learned as kids that they were very helpful emotions because they, they pushed you to be better. And so in some ways, we learned this kind of short-term trick that if I feel guilty enough about not having finished my homework or about not having taken advantage of my privileges of having a good education or not having cleaned up my room or uh, not having treated people kindly, if I just feel guilty enough or ashamed enough, then I'll improve my game. And so I think that these emotions work, but they're very fragile. Uh, They give you a very fragile foundation. And so part of... um, so I don't know how I got off on this weird tangent, but part of, part of uh, I, I guess, talking about my own shame uh, being laid off, but part of, what, um, part of what's helped me in terms of improving my life over the last 13 years has been to try fairly consciously to shift away from emotions like shame and to think more about how to be kinder, more helpful, more loving, stuff like that, which I, all of which I fail at the whole time. But at least I don't think you fail at the whole time, <laughs> but, but it was seventy percent of the time. But um, so when you were saying before, Bill, about how with your podcast you feel like you're sharing and you're helping people, uh, I think you're tapping into one of these deep truths that, again, like all truths, is kind of platitudinous but really important. That the more you become sharing and helpful and think about serving other people, the better things become. And so the great, the great irony, this is what behavioral psychologists like Kahneman and like talk about, right? We get on this hedonic treadmill where it's all about hedonism. It's all about me. How am I going to make myself feel better? And so you keep kind of filling this gaping hole with more toast and more donuts and more uh, sex and more money and more power and more validation from people approving of you. And and all of this stuff, I think, just doesn't really work. I mean, it works temporarily um, because it all has energy. But I think it becomes, your happiness becomes much more sustainable when you're doing things like helping other people. And, and, and when, you look at, when you look at all of the great investors that I've interviewed who were very sharing and charitable and giving and have worked on themselves a lot, I, I feel like they all kind of validate that. I see that when I look at the Buffets and the Mungers. And I interviewed Manish Pabrai the other day for my podcast, which will come out, I think, next week. And uh, he was talking, I, I was asking about how he's changed over the years. And it became pretty clear that he has a much deeper sense of service. I don't think he would have said that a decade ago. He might have thought it, but I don't think he would have said it. And so I... I think shifting towards that sense of service and that sense of um, trying to help other people just works better. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. Um, I, you know, it's it's funny how um, like shame, whatever whatever uh, sense I had came from. I, I think uh, it's not an unrealistic accounting of of my history to say that. I uh, I didn't have many problems from a monetary standpoint, but I I was dealt plenty of cards. I mean, my wife sometimes like really reminds me of that when I uh, you know, when I'm like I didn't you know have any any adversity or whatever. She'll go through it a little. Um, but uh, it's amazing how much I have not felt worthy of anything that I have because I've just attributed it to somebody else, and then for a long time I discounted anything that I did well as like well you know of course that's what that's what should have happened but then any failure I like beat myself up over like crazy yeah uh and it took a while to get past that to be like no I did earn some of that stuff and I you know I do have things to be proud of it I probably took man it probably took 32 years and I think I started to do it I think it happened after this men's weekend that I went to where I don't know this guy got me all riled up and I screamed at some people and I they, they thought I was talking to my parents but I wasn't you know it's like a person that represents uh you know it was I think it was a conversation that I had to have yeah 
Um, it wasn't even necessarily a bad one. It was just one that I had to have. Uh, and that, that kind of unlocks some things for me. I think it's, it may sound sort of silly, but, uh, I don't think it was. I, I think this sense of unworthiness is a, is a really powerful thing that may, maybe, maybe men in particular, I don't know. I just, what do I know? Um, may, maybe men don't explore very often. We don't talk about very often because we're so busy trying to be sort of macho and superior and tough and impregnable and, and the like and impressive that admitting to a sense of unworthiness is it's it's kind of embarrassing and, and weak um but i i think it's a very powerful thing and how do you how do you deal with it unless you're candid about it um and i yeah i i think about this a lot it's it's funny though so i don't know if you ever heard it Again, it sounds like a weird tangent. There's a beautiful song called If I'm Unworthy by this guy. I think it's Blake Mills. It has an extraordinary guitar in it. A uh, really beautiful song. So so I often think of that line, which, um, because, uh, yeah, it just begins with this beautiful line, If I'm Unworthy. Uh, hmm. And it kind of resonates in your brain. Because I, I do think we have a sense of unworthiness. It's like this this feeling in some way that I'm you're writing unworthy. this down so I don't forget it. Yeah. I hope you like it. So there's this sense, there's a sense of being unlovable for some reason. And I mean, I think, I think that's in a romantic setting in that song, if I remember rightly, but I don't know, man, I would argue when I, when I, before I dealt with some of this stuff, I don't know that I love myself. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a very, that's a very hard one for, I, I, I keep resorting to generalities like, for men or for English people, I suddenly am thinking it's a very hard one for English people. You know, we, we, the idea of loving myself, you know, like I, when I came to America and I would hear Americans on talk shows and they would talk about it and I've learned to love myself. And I'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, Rub uh, some dirt on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've always hated myself. Well, I shouldn't, <laughs> uh, but I, but I do think we kind of internalize this sense that if you just beat yourself up a little more and you just drove yourself harder, um, somehow you'd be more lovable. And, and again, like shame and guilt, it works in the short term. Like you actually can drive yourself really hard if you're constantly seeking external validation and proof that somehow you're lovable. But I think it's, it's a really fragile foundation. It leads to all sorts of problems. Like just sort of unhappiness. And so I think you're having to rewire yourself as an adult once you become conscious of this stuff. And, and, and it may be that many of us find it so painful to face this stuff that it becomes very difficult to rewire. And, and so part, part of what's been helpful to me, I, I can't remember if we talked about this last time I was on your show. So for, Forgive me if I'm being repetitive, but um, you can do it. Sometimes what, it's good to revisit the important yeah. stuff, man. And you can do what my kids do and just tune me out at a certain point. No, no, I'm, I'm very it's listening. I'm listening well. very carefully. Um, so, so part of what I've been working on over the last year or two, I'd say, have been um, these sort of two tracks of studying these Tibetan Buddhists and also studying David Hawkins where they both have a similar way of dealing with this stuff where, um, so Hawkins, I, I, I would encourage people to read letting go, which I think is one of his more practical and grounded books. And there's a bit in chapter two where he talks about this mechanism of letting go, which I'll kind of garble, but I think is incredibly important where what he's basically saying is when you, when you feel stuff arising, like these emotions that are difficult or these patterns or, thoughts that are difficult that you don't particularly like and that are very uncomfortable instead of judging them or suppressing them or trying to change them or projecting them onto somebody else because you can't bear it so you you start to think i can't stand this guy i can't believe he's behaving that way when actually it's just it's just triggered something in you that you need to deal with yourself so instead of trying to change or judge or suppress any of these thoughts or feelings you let them arise and you kind of you kind of look at them and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, okay, I see that. And because you're not resisting them, Hawkins' view is that the energy behind them gradually dissipates. 
And he also has this approach of surrender that I think is very interesting where I, mean, I think the subtitle of letting go is the path of surrender or something like that. And there is a, there is a sort of deeply spiritual aspect to what Hawkins is doing. He, he calls his path the path of, uh, I think, devotional non-dualism. And it's very connected both to Buddhism and Hinduism, I would say. And, and so he's surrendering a lot of these emotions, difficult thoughts and feelings to God, I would say. But it's just this, so if, if you don't believe in God, fine, you know, whatever it is you believe in, like you, you surrender them to your ancestors, to your grandmother, to your, um, to nature, to the better part of yourself, to, you know, what, whatever it is. Um, but that sense of you let stuff arise and then you let it go in some way without resisting it, I think is a very, very powerful mechanism that really goes deep. And, and there's a very strong connection to what these Tibetan Buddhists are doing, as I understand it. So I, I started studying this great lineage of Tibetan Buddhists that includes this guy called Sokni Rinpoche, which is T-S-O-K-N-Y-I Rinpoche. And Rinpoche means precious one, I think. And he has a brother called Mingyur Rinpoche, who's also amazing. And their father was called Tulku Urjian Rinpoche, and he was also amazing. So it's this great lineage that goes back, you know, whatever, a thousand years or whatever. And obviously the Buddhists were studying the mind. They were sitting there studying the mind and just watching the way that the mind operates. And so the kind of masters are dealing with this stuff. Um, and one of the things that Sokni Rinpoche says, I think is a very helpful way of thinking about this, is he describes these difficult thought patterns and emotions uh, and, and kind of recurring patterns of reaction and behavior, uh, all, all of the things that trouble us, um, that, that come up again and again in our minds. He calls them your beautiful monsters. And, mm. and he says, um, again, instead of judging your beautiful monsters and hating them and suppressing them, and denying them, he says, he says, you need to befriend them and treat them in this kind and compassionate and loving way because they're part of your phenomenon. And so there's a course that I, I, I've been doing on and off for the last year or so that he has online. It's called Fully Being. I, I think it's very good. I think, I think he's, he's kind of remarkable in many ways. He has a lovely presence. Uh, and, and he says, I think in that, one day we will be friends with all of our beautiful monsters. Mm. And I love that idea that instead of, instead of looking at that sense, say, of uh, something, something triggers a sense of shame or a sense of embarrassment or a sense of humiliation or a sense of being unlovable. Um, and it comes up and, and, and you look at it and what, what Sokni Rinpoche says is he, he has this whole practice called handshake practice. And so you greet it and you say, you know, hi, yeah, all right, I see you. Uh, there you are. And, uh, you know, welcome, 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 but you're not, you're not indulging it and you're not getting super entangled in it and you're not getting obsessed with it, but you're also not suppressing it and denying it. And so I think it, it, it accords with what David Hawkins is saying that when you don't resist things, the energy dissipates, the energy behind them dissipates. And so this gives you a practical way of dismantling or disarming these very painful emotions and patterns that maybe we never dealt with. And maybe, maybe you could do it by going to a really good psychiatrist or something, or maybe I, I'm sure there are lots of, you know, there are many paths up the mountain, but I, I think this is part of your repertoire or one's repertoire is a very, very helpful mindset. And it's, it's a, it's a more friendly mindset. Like if you, if you think if, if one of your kids got really scared or, was really irrational or wet the bed or was ashamed. Um, you know, you wouldn't go there and be like, you idiot, I can't believe you did that. What sort of a schmuck are you? You'd be like, hopefully I wouldn't. Sometimes I some, say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Yeah, yes. you'll do, especially when we're yeah. stressed. But, you know, if your kid runs into you and you realize that they've just wet the bed or something and they're totally ashamed or whatever, or they went to a friend's yeah. house and wet the bed or whatever it is, it's, you know, some form of, of shame or failure or disappointment, you, at, at your best or at your, your re reasonably decent, you yeah. treat them really compassionately. And then there's this question, 
why would you treat yourself with so much less compassion than your kid or your friend? Mm. I, I, I did this once. I suggested this to my son at one point because um, we were both doing some meditation. And I said, you know, picture, picture yourself as a little kid and kind of cradle yourself while you're meditating. Like think, I, I've only done this once or twice myself, I think, but it's very powerful where you're like, why shouldn't I be the little kid that I'm comforting and be kind to? Why, you know, why, why should I treat myself so much more brutally than I would treat a friend who's in trouble or a kid who's in trouble? And, and so I think we just, we just internalize this idea that it works to be brutal to ourselves. And because it worked enough that it got us through exams, it got us through periods where we disappointed, you know, relatives or teachers or authority figures of some sort, you know, you saw, you were like, okay, I'm really in trouble. I'm going to pull my finger out and I'm going to work really hard and I'm going to try to be better. I'm not going to swear at my mother anymore or whatever it is, you know, and then you behaved well. And they said, you've been really fantastic this last, you know, this afternoon. I'm just so impressed and I'm so proud of you. And you'd be like, Oh, so it works when I beat myself up and I harness my shame and my guilt and my, my self-loathing and everyone approves of it. And so uh, there, there are probably all of these deep patterns that we internalized very early on that worked. And you're having now, and I, I'm totally aware that I'm utterly unsophisticated about this and any, any psychiatrist or whatever, anyone who's had training will be shaking their head and be like, I can't believe this rude. But, um, but I think for, for me, I'm a slow remedial learner. And so it's taken a while for me to say, oh, so I internalized all of this stuff that worked, but probably wasn't very helpful. And I, I need to find a better way. And part of the joy of getting older is that you discover that all of these things are kind of changeable to some degree, that we are, we are plastic, you know, just as there's neuroplasticity. In, there's, a, there's a great Kabbalist, Rav Ashlake, who said that it's a spiritual law that uh, any negative characteristic that you have, you can change. And he wasn't saying, this is an observation. Uh, hmm. And this is what I believe. He's like, this is a spiritual law. And so I look at these things and I'm like, yeah, so, so if I have anger or hatred or jealousy or whatever, and it comes up, I'm like, oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I, I like that concept of acknowledging it because I think that to try to run from it also like almost empowers it, right? Because you're almost saying if you can't acknowledge it, that it's so powerful that you don't want to touch it like in a way. Yeah. Uh, at least that's what my mind tells me. And I kind of wonder if like, you know, the you hear all these stories about like Michael Jordan and what drove him. And I think Tiger Woods probably didn't exactly have the healthiest mindset uh, from a from a happiness standpoint young in his career. And I see those those super outliers that use that as drive. And I think maybe in the past I've been like, I need more of that. But I definitely didn't need more of that. And and. I think that what is not told, I mean, it's a form of survivorship bias is all the people that use that, that never, uh, you know, had really bad outcomes because well, of people it, right? who used it and it, it worked in one area, but it yeah. like, wasted their lives in all of these other areas. So I, I think it's not, uh, it's not an accident that many of the great investors that I've interviewed ended up with broken relationships and, um, Monish Pabrai, um was visiting Charlie Munger probably a year ago and took this, I mean, he visits him a lot, but he took this wonderful video in which he asked him about my book. And um, Munger was very kind and flattering about the book. And then Monish, as, as I remember this video that he sent me, said, um, were there any insights that were particularly striking to you, Charlie? And Charlie said, yeah, how many of us ended up divorced or in broken relationships? Hmm. And one of the reasons for that, I, I think is probably because um, they're a little less emotional than, than a lot of people. Uh, to be a great investor, it helps if you're maybe a little bit emotionally stunted, um, which doesn't necessarily help you in your relationships. But I think it's also because they were ferociously driven and captivated by this. And this is the point Charlie was making, that it was such an all-consuming game it was very easy to neglect their partners. And yeah. so there's, there's, there's often a price. So one of the things that's been helpful to me as a question in the last few months is, is to say, you know, 
what are you optimizing for? What is it you really want? Like, are you optimizing for maximum returns, maximum profit, maximum wealth, maximum approval from the outside world? Or what's your measure of a successful and happy and abundant life? And um, I, I, I remember a discussion with Tony Robbins about this a few years ago, where he was sort of giving examples of what constituted a beautiful life for different people. And he was saying, you know, for one person, it's going to be to write a book. And for another person, it's going to be to have three kids. And for another person, it's going to be to have a garden. And I thought it was really interesting that at the end of the conversation, he kind of added, or to be closer to that God. And that's really interesting, right? For, uh, because also your, your motives and what drives you changes over the course of your life. So I used to be, I mean, I've done a grand tour of all of these, uh, these, these beliefs. So I, I was kind of conventionally observant as a Jewish kid who went through a bar mitzvah and stuff like that. But I mainly just wanted to get my presents, um, which included about a thousand pounds that enabled me to buy an incredible stereo. Uh, nice. So that was and really a fun my, party. My, exactly. So that was my religious upbringing was largely the culminating in the present, the, in the gifts that enabled me to buy a stereo. But then I- I grew up in Boca Raton. I saw a lot of that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're familiar. So then I became kind of agnostic and then I became atheistic. And then coincidental with my getting laid off from time, actually uh, very shortly before that, I started to become increasingly spiritual. And that's been a huge unexpected shift in my life over the last 13, 14 years that's made my life infinitely richer. And so I would have poo-pooed the idea that, you know, rolled my eyes and just thought, you know, yeah, right. Like if you're a moron, that's a, that's a good, that's, that's a good goal. Good luck with that one, Duke. Um, <laughs> and, um, and now I'm kind of like, yeah, well, there's a, there's a teaching of Rav Ashlag's, the Kabbalist I, I, mentioned before, where he said, basically, your purpose, the, the purpose of creation is to cleave to your creator, to become more and closer and closer to your creator. And he says, the reason, the reason, you know, the way, the way that you do it is through what he calls an affinity of forms. And so if there's this force of creation that's loving and sharing and kind and compassionate and creative and all of that, you want to become more loving, kinder, more compassionate, more sharing. Um, and overcome what he calls the desire to receive for the self alone, which is like me, 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 everything for me. And so, so he's sort of setting out the path as being actually a matter of how, how do you become closer to your creator by, by becoming a better person? And hmm. that, that to me increasingly makes a hell of a lot of sense. And so when you said to me before that you've shifted away from wanting to have maximum returns and manage other people's money and get that sort of external validation as a money manager. And you're like, I'd actually really like to be there for my kids. And I'd really like to do this podcast and talk to people and learn in public and share what I'm learning. That's much more attuned to what Rav Ashlag is talking about, which is cleaving to your creator. And it's not a, it's not a creator in a sense of like, you know, a guy with a white beard up on a cloud. Um, it's a, there's a, a, there's a sense that there's this force of, infinite giving and love and sharing and kindness and all of that. And, and look, I, as I said, I've had all of the different belief positions that the one thing, you know, is that I've been wrong. Uh, and so, you know, you know, this is all very personal and I'm not trying to, trying to proselytize in any way, but I think, I think when you swim with the tide and you try to shift in the direction of being less selfish and kinder and more compassionate and stuff, things kind of improve. And then you look back and you're like, wow, why do I feel happier? And so I felt much more depleted when, you know, in, in the days before I got laid off um, by time when I felt kind of conventionally successful in certain ways, but very dependent on external validation, you know, on, well, here's my big shot title and here's my big, you know, uh, you know, here are the big shot people that I'm interviewing. And, you know, I, I would go to India and I'd interview the Indian prime minister, a guy who's in, you know, overseeing a billion people or more or whatever. And you'd be sitting like four feet from him looking into his eyes. And, um, 
you know, it was a very, it was a very interesting, head spinning, intense life. And I, you know, it was really fun in some ways. But I didn't really stop to think, is this true to who I am? Why am I doing it? Am I, you know, am I doing anything of any enduring value? And so in some strange way, I, f- I feel like I had to get all of that yanked away from me because it was so intoxicating that I don't think I would have left it of my own volition. And once it was yanked away, that left a space for me to start to say, so what actually do I want to do with my life? What's hmm. true to me? What, how do I harness the gifts that I've been given and the opportunities I've been given? And, and I think even asking that question is a very helpful place to start. And so I, I remember one great teacher saying, you should be asking every day. You should be saying, okay, please reveal to me the purpose of my soul. What am I here for? And um, again, I'm not proselytizing in any way. What do I know? Um, but I think, I think that openness, that sense of instead of madly rushing to get a promotion, <laughs> a, a pay hike, uh, a better title, more respect, you know, unquestioning, unquestioningly rushing to get more of that validation to fill the hole. Uh, I think it's really helpful to stop and say, okay, please just show me what I'm supposed to do. What's the purpose of my soul? Like why, you know, in your, in your position, why were you given these talents, these particular talents, these particular opportunities, these particular challenges that you face? Um, and that's, once you start to be open and ask that question, maybe also it softens you up a little, makes you a little more humble. And so instead of saying, I know this is what's right for me, um, you're a little more accessible to hearing. And I, I, I don't know, it's kind of like when you, um, when you have a conversation with someone and you think you can say something that can help them, but they're so busy talking and telling you what they figured out about life and universe that you're like, ah, I just can't talk to this person. They're not going to hear, which probably <laughs> yeah. with me pretty perfectly. No, not at all. I, I love talking to you, man. I, and I'm glad that, uh, I'm really glad that, that this episode is going this way because, um, you know, I just, I honestly, man, what, that the first day that we met when we had lunch, that was like one of my favorite days, uh, that I've, that I've had, like, that was a really memorable day. You know, and it was like um, going back to what investing has given me. Right. If I'm not an investor, then I'm not in that room at Markel and I don't ask you to have lunch and you don't say yes. And, you know, uh, like these are meaningful conversations. And I think this is what life is actually about. Um, I think, you know, the, I think we're on some kind of parallel journey together, Bill. And if I I mean, if I'm I am kind of a mystic about these things. And so I think people come into your reason in, into your life for a reason. And so, you know, we met, and whether that's true or not, or whether it's just a helpful delusion or illusion, who knows? I, I, I feel pretty strongly that it's true. And it may be that believing that it's true makes it true. Uh, but um, I, think, I think we met for some kind of a reason. And I, I think we're sort of fellow travelers on this kind of journey of trying to figure things out. And if you can come in at an opportune moment and help the other person or talk about a particular issue, um, that's on their mind or help, help to share something that you've learned. And then they later share something they've learned or whatever, or somebody else shares something. It's, 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 a uh, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be a quid pro quo because I think also there's a sense that, um, once that's your mindset where you're looking to help other people, you're constantly getting help in all sorts of different ways, not necessarily by that person, but by other people. And so it becomes this kind of really beautiful feeling that the world is looking out for you. And I, I was interviewing Monish the other day, and I, I wonder if people will even hear this bit. You know, a lot, a lot of people, because so much is said that it's really easy for your eyes to glaze over. But right at the end, I said something to him, and he said, uh, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned this guy, the colonel, who came in to run the Dakshana Foundation for many years. He's one of the most extraordinary people I've ever met. He's an incredible human being who, who ran the Dakshana Foundation for one rupee a year. And, wow. and he said uh, he had lost his daughter. His, his daughter had died, I think, in a car crash when she was pregnant. And he said, the Lord took away my child and gave me a thousand children to take care of. And so 
he was looking after all mm. of these kids at the Dak Shana Foundation. Just an amazing guy. And I mentioned him very briefly in that interview with Monish on my podcast. And I said, um, I said, yeah, and you were incredibly lucky to get the colonel. And he and Monish said, when you do the right thing, the universe conspires to help you. And that's really interesting to hear someone as profoundly rational and cerebral as Monish expressing such a profoundly mystical and spiritual idea that I, I really deeply believe is true. And so I think, I think that's interesting that the world is conspiring to help us in all sorts of ways as we try to become better people. Yeah, I think that I, I, I subscribe to that. And, and what I've noticed is there's a, you know, there's a group of people and they seem to operate in similar ways. Uh, and you know, whether or not it's becoming one of them puts you in the peer group or whatever. But like one of the guys that I'm thinking of is, uh, Saurabh, you know, he's yeah. just like, he's just a guy that if I can ever do anything to help him, I will do it, yeah. you know? And, and the reason is I know he would say the same. Uh, I, I don't know how I can help him. Right. But, but there was a way once upon a time and I'm glad that I was there for him. I was in Omaha recently for the Berkshire annual meeting and Guy Spear had a Friday night dinner and I was in this room with Guy and a bunch of other good friends and Saurabh came in. Um, this is Saurabh Madan, who, for people who don't know, if you, if you look at the Google talks um, on investing, Saurabh hosted most of them, uh, um, including mine, which I looked at the other day and has, has, a, has a lot of hits and at the top, someone, someone's written great content, terrible speaker. <laughs> really me laugh. Aren't the aren't the comments just oh, great? It's, it's, uh, <laughs> but at least I could I could laugh at that. It's pretty funny. Great content. Terrible speaker. And 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 then I I put a dislike on it, which I never do. And I say, you fucking idiot! Really, you're serious? You're going to dislike that? And and so I thought I thought maybe I should actually put like on this comment instead. It'd be better for my ego. But when Sorab came into this room in Omaha, people, including me, lit up. Like I felt myself like, ah, it's lovely to see you. What an amazing yeah. thing to have that be the way that the world greets you because he's just a really lovely bloke. He's a very warm, kind, generous, sharing guy. And so in, in practical terms, if you want to be cynical about this, you could say, well, as Robert Cialdini says, there's reciprocation bias. And when you're decent and you're helpful and you're kind and you do good stuff to other people, they also want to help you. And so this is something that Guy Spear figured out very early in his career. And he was like, well, so if I become nicer and kinder and I'm looking to help people and people will do good stuff to me. Um, and so it's relatively cynical at first. And then what Guy found, and, and he wrote about this in the Educational Value Investor, which for your readers who haven't listened, I, I would really encourage you to read. Um, and I'm totally biased because I, A, he's a old friend B, I helped him write the book. But um, but he talks about this very candidly about how initially it was selfish, but then you become kind of addicted to the to to helping people because you start to feel so good when you help people. And so so it's a sort of positive addiction. Yeah. So I think what's interesting is when you see people like Guy Monish Pabrai, Saurabh Madan, Tom Gaynor, Buffett, Munga, and you see them all working on themselves, trying to become better people. There's something very inspiring about it. It's, there's, there's, a, um, there's something really deep going on here that if you, if you tap into, is really life-changing. Because I, I can see, for example, over the last few years, the changes in Monish, right? I, I asked him about this in our interview where I said, I, like, you've just become gentler and softer and kinder over the years. Like, do you, was that a conscious effort or did it just kind of happen? But I definitely see it. I see it. In, I, I, I think it was very striking at the Berkshire Hathaway meeting also when Buffett was talking about, I, I for it's it's really worth looking at the replay for people who weren't there or who don't remember this because it was very easy to miss. 
where he showed the pictures of these optical illusions. I think they were vases or something that could be women's faces or something like that. And he started talking about how when he read Ben Graham, there was a certain chapter, I think, of The Intelligent Investor, where he suddenly saw something that he'd never seen before and kind of the scales fell from his eyes. And he understood that the way he had been investing was really dumb and that he should invest in a different way based on what he'd learned from Graham. And then he said, this can happen in other areas of your life too. And he said, suddenly your mind just sees things totally different. So he said, he said maybe, maybe you just suddenly realize that you need to be kinder or that to be loved, you need to be more lovable, something like that. If you, if you look at the transcript, it's really mm. worth looking at because he said it in, in such a way that it's really easy to miss what he said. And, hmm. and later, later in that same conversation, he was talking about the realization that if, if you've had a really successful life, you really want to look back and be like, how can I be a better person in the second half of my life than in the first half? And I think at some level, what Buffett was doing was saying, I screwed up in the first half of my life. You know, maybe my marriage didn't work out as well as it should. I mean, his, his, his wife kind of separated from him and his kids, I think, probably um, didn't get as much attention from him as they might have done. And I, I'm not saying any of this to be critical. I think, you know, to operate at that sort of level um, takes a kind of ferocious focus. But I think what he was saying is that he's learned to be a better person. And he wasn't trying to say it in a self-congratulatory way. But he's giving you this really important clue that you want to become more lovable. And how do you become more lovable? You know, you love more. You you uh, you give more. And so I I just keep picking up these clues where I see certain things that Buffett and Munger do, or that Monish and Guy do, for example. And I'm like, oh, that's how it works. Well, Tom Gaynor, I give you a beautiful example with Tom Gaynor since you and I met at the Markel brunch. So a few months ago. Um, I email Tom and I say, you know, I've become this advisor to this investment firm and they're having a, an offsite event and we're going to be like 30 people or so. Some really interesting people will be there and I want to interview a great investor there. And would you come? Um, could I interview you for an hour or something like that? Tom immediately replies, comes to this event, there's nothing in it for him. I mean, he, he comes the night before, has this lovely dinner with a bunch of us. Um, and then I interview him the next morning. He doesn't have time to stay to listen to a couple of the events that are really great, uh, really, really interesting speakers. And um, turns out he's taken a train for six hours from Virginia to come to this event, to have dinner, and then be interviewed by me the next morning. And then he gets a train home. So here's hmm. a guy who's co-CEO of a Fortune 400 company. He's overseeing, what, 17,000 people and about 20 private companies and probably 20 billion or so in assets. And he makes the effort to do that. And yeah. that's just- Yeah, he a, drove his Prius to a train. Exactly. And that's, yeah. just a, that's just a really kind and decent bloke. And when you see something like that, you never forget it. I mean, I don't-, I don't of all of, the, all of the things that I've seen in my interactions with Tom, interviewing him and the like, nothing speaks louder than the fact that he took a train for six hours from Virginia for that event. And hmm. so, you know, he wasn't taking a private plane. He wasn't, he wasn't saying, no, I'm too busy. There's nothing. He, he, he didn't take the offer of doing it over Zoom, which would have been much easier because he said, I think the energy is much better when you're in person. Yeah, he was one of the first to have an in-person meeting. Yeah. I, I gave him a hug when I saw him. I was like, thank God you're doing this. The ice needed to be broken. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So Tom is someone who has deep wisdom, right? So Tom understands the importance of human relationships, understands the importance of doing the right thing, being kind, taking care of other people, helping people. And so so in in my book, when I interviewed and wrote about Tom, I think in the chapter on on habits, on high performance habits. One of the things he said is um, the part of his competitive advantage is that he's a nice guy. And he wasn't saying it in a conceited way. He was saying, there are just so many people who want to help me. And he said, it just helps 
And that's sort of what you were saying about sorrow as well. So there, there are deep truths here that I think, I think for, for your listeners, if, you know, some of it, they'll, they'll just be listening to us and be like, God, what are these guys droning on about? Some of it, <laughs> if, if there's something. Actionable. If they're still listening, that's probably not their answer. Or <laughs> yeah. They probably understand by now. Maybe. But, I think, but I think if there's a takeaway here, it's to start looking at the way that people like Gaynor, Buffett, Munger, Monish Pavrai, Guy Spear, the way that they're behaving, that in that in in David Hawkins terminology makes you go strong. And look at the way that people behave that makes you go weak. So when you see mm. somebody, when you see politicians lying, or you see, I mean, even when I say that, there's a part of me that sinks. Um, when you see you know, the behavior of the people on billions or succession. And you start to think, God, the, the whole world is just this dog eat dog world where it's a zero sum game. It makes you go weak. Or when you see someone lying or uh, just looking out for themselves, it makes you go weak. And when you, and when you see people behaving like Tom did when he came to New York for that meeting, it makes you go strong and it makes you, so there's actually a really, really important underlying set of principles here. And when I look at Monish, I mean, this is, if, if, if people have the time and energy, I hope they'll listen to the interview that I did with Monish, which hasn't been released yet um, on my podcast, just because I think, I, I think if you listen carefully, you start to be like, oh, that's what works in life. And hmm. so Monish, for example, reading David Hawkins and, and saying, I'm only going to be truthful. I'm just going to be honest. I'm going to have integrity. That decision has led to all sorts of remarkable things happening in his life, including Munger becoming a very close friend and mentor of his, Buffett becoming a friend, Lee Lu, one of the greatest ambassadors of our time, becoming a close friend, Guy becoming a very close friend. All of It is like the world is conspiring to help him. And as a result, he's able to lift thousands and thousands of really deserving, really bright, really underprivileged kids out of poverty through his foundation. He's able to make lots of money as an investor, although he doesn't intend to, uh, to have it when he dies because he's going to give it away. Uh, and he has these two really lovely daughters that he has a great relationship with from what I can see. And so it's all by understanding certain principles about how to behave. And so that's, that's in a sense what I'm getting at is, um, and maybe this gets back to what we were, what we were talking about before, where I was saying, instead of becoming obsessed with things like shame and guilt, which calibrate really low, flood the zone with these more powerful principles, um, that people like Gaynor and Monish and Guy, um, Warren and Charlie, uh, uh, illustrating at their best. This isn't to say they're all perfect because they like us no doubt behave crappily at times, I'm sure. And if, and if they don't anymore, they certainly did in the past. And so we all have both sides within us. But if you gradually start to tilt the balance in one direction, um, in, a, in a better direction, uh, being as, as Tom Gaynor would say, directionally correct, the impact is kind of overwhelming. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, yeah, well, it's certainly what I've seen, right? Uh, I I don't uh, I don't know, you know, my n equals one, but it's the only the only view that I have, right? And uh, I think it aligns you in this win win uh, mentality. I think Rishi uh, at, at Google, he's I think he's the one that introduced me to the idea of playing win win games or. Um, you know, rather than zero sum games. And I, I believe he attributes it to Naval. But uh, when he said it, it was like one of those truths that just struck me. Charlie is like, obsessed yes. with the idea of win win games. And if, and Peter Kaufman, who's a very close friend of Charlie's, is obsessed with the idea of win win games. And, and so, yeah, it's funny. I remember Guy saying to me once that um, whenever he had some major revelation, and was congratulating himself on something he'd figured out. He discovered that Buffett figured it out 40 years earlier. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it's like Naval can congratulate himself if he wants on figuring this out. But you look at Munger, who's 98, 
and he figured this out a long time ago. And and you look at something like Costco, which Charlie was on the board of, or, you know, was chairman of the board of. I I, I think he may have stopped being chairman now. Um, but he's been very closely uh, involved with Costco. Costco embodies this sense of wanting to be a win for everybody in its ecosystem. You know, the customer is doing great. I think they treat their employees pretty well in the grand scheme of things. Um, their shareholders are doing great because they treat the customers great. And so the more you can tap into these ideas of um, not treating life as a zero-sum game where you're going you're gonna to crush everyone and impress everyone with your brilliance and uh, um, the, the better it gets. And, it, and I, I think part of what was difficult for me was that I came out of this system in England that was very brittle. It was very... I mean, I, I went to Eton and then to Oxford. And so it's a very out of scorecard world where you really wanted people to know how bright you were. And you wanted to have, I, I don't know, you wanted impressive credentials. And that drove me a lot, that desire to impress. But when it doesn't really work to make you happy, you're kind of lost. And so you have to. You have to figure out, am I just going to run twice as fast and push twice as hard to get the world to notice me and validate me? Or do I have to find a different system? Mm -hmm. And so for me, what's been very powerful has been to see this whole other system and see it at work. And, and so I, I said to Monish the other day when I was interviewing him, do you, I, I, I said, in some ways, it seems like you've been engaged in this grand experiment with the principles that you learned from David Hawkins. And he's like, it's not an experiment anymore. It worked. Hmm. And that's what's kind of cool. You want to look to people who are a little further along on the path and be like, what worked? And when, when you see it, um, go big on that. It's not an accident when you see these patterns. And I guess, I guess that's what I do as a writer and as an interviewer is I'm trying to figure out these patterns of what works. But it goes back to what, what Munger says, right? I observe what works and doesn't work and why. Yeah. It's been fun to listen to you interview. Have you enjoyed doing it? Yeah. I, have. I mean, I know you've always done it, but now it's, yeah. you know, broadcast and audio. I find it, I find it stressful. I'm surprised at how stressful I find it. Um, probably was more stressful at the start, but no, it's, it's still stressful. I interviewed Guy Spear a couple of weeks, uh, probably a week or so ago, I was stressed before. I, I've spent hundreds of hours talking with Guy over the years, and I was still stressed. And I was partly stressed because I went to an event recently where a great, uh, uh, a great novelist was inter interviewed by a close friend of hers, and it was just terrible. It was all so self-referential, and it was all about their friendship. And, why, you know, and it, was, it was like, I, I don't know, it wasn't really there for the audience. And so... When I see other people screw up, I'm aware that I can screw up really badly myself. And so there's always this question of, uh, so, so yeah, there's, there's still quite a lot of performance anxiety. So part of what I do is I prepare obsessively. So I, I spend several days preparing for an interview. Um, yeah. I'm interviewing someone in a few weeks and I realized I've ordered seven of his books uh, in preparation. And it's not that I'll read all of them, but I'll, I'll graze. I'll go through them. I'll, you know, and I end up with probably 15 pages of questions for many of my interviews. And so, so yeah, it's stressful and I'm as obsessive as ever. Um, but when, um, when it's good, it's really a deep pleasure. When, so, when someone tells you something that's true and that's really honest and that's really candid, um, like, ah, okay. That's it. That's beautiful. Yeah. I've been trying to interview people who um, are very honest. I don't know. I was, I, was in, I was listening to an interview of yours that you did with that guy from, um, from Kenya. Talking yeah. About his, yeah, Eric McQuire. Yeah, talking about his childhood. And I thought it was very moving when he was talking about, you know, um, his struggles to stay in school and how he needed all of these different people to step up and give him scholarships and how he needed amazing story. Right. Yeah. And I just think when you hear people 
tell their stories and they're moving and true. There's something just intensely beautiful about it. And, and also, um, there's something very intimate about hearing people's voices. Yeah. It's sort of inside your head. So, so I'm torn, right? There's a part of me that thinks, oh, it's a really ephemeral form. And what's the point? And I should just be writing because that's the real game. And then there's a part of me that's like, no, I really love listening to conversations. I mean, I, I've listened to so many hundreds of hours of shows like Fresh Air where Terry Gross interviews people and she's just been an amazing interviewer. And I've, I've always loved conversations. I don't know. Do you have any tips for me? What should I, what have you, what have you figured I, out over the last? I time? don't know, man. You're quite good at what you do. I, you know, I was listening to an episode today um, that I had recorded and I guess that my, my most, my biggest thought at the moment is I think I messed up the interview as a questioner because uh, one, I really, I really wanted to help the person that I was interviewing. And two, I kind of, um, I think I had some questions for the person that were not authentic to the conversation that I was having, mm. if that makes sense. And I think it made the interview a little bit choppier than it should have been. Um, and actually in sort of uh, focusing on the questions that I thought would be, would be right, I think I missed the questions that could have made the conversation great, that could have made the person, um, you know, could have highlighted who I wanted to highlight, right? But there yeah. was like a, a tension between the execution and, and I'm, I don't know, I'm upset at myself for it. That, that would be the only thing that, uh, but I, I think you're very good to listen to, man. I'd, I'd listen to them all. Uh, thanks. But it's funny, Bill, as an interviewer, you know, I'm sort of trained to try to notice stuff, right? And so as I asked you that question about what you've learned and you started to admit this very vulnerable thing about where you thought you'd messed up, your right arm crossed over your body and clenched your left arm in this kind of protective <laughs> position. My daughter would say it's like you're, you're protecting yourself against a predator or something against yeah. that. And I suddenly felt something on my forehead and realized that I had a bead of sweat on my forehead. So, <laughs> so as we start to discuss what we're trying to learn about interviewing, both of us actually have this weird physiological reaction yeah. Yeah. That was totally, I, I could not have controlled that. Right. I was, I was thinking elsewhere and I just did it. Right. And I'm like, what is that? Is there literally, is there like a fly on my forehead? And then I reach up and I'm like, no, I'm hot as well. It's, it's literally a bead of sweat. And so that's really interesting to me that we, we care so deeply and we're so worried also about being judged as somehow having screwed it up. So that's somewhere where our fear of being unlovable and showing our showing our failure, showing our stupidity, showing our incompetence very publicly comes in. And, and the way I deal with it is by forcing myself to prepare obsessively. So at least I have as much control over the material as possible. And then, and then again, we were talking about letting go and surrendering before. And there is some weird aspect that I'm trying where, again, I'm not trying any way to be pious or sanctimonious or proselytizing. But if I say to myself before an interview or before writing anything or before giving a speech, if I'm trying to say to myself, let, let me be a force for good. Let this somehow reveal light in some way. Let me shift the world in some small way towards something good. You know, there's something about it's kind, of, it's kind of like, um, you know, how, I mean, like, again, I'm talking about something I know nothing about, but how Buddhists talk about um, dedicating their practice when they're meditating. Um, and, and Kabbalists, uh, you know, who I study a lot, um, they talk about the kavanot, the direction, like the, the intention behind a prayer. And so I think there's something about setting an intention that's really powerful. And so just deciding, this, this is not just about the ego of William Green or selling books or making my reputation bigger or getting more Twitter followers or whatever. And it's like, there's, there's a big part of that ego that's 
um, part of our ancient survival instinct, I think, that wants us to to, to survive in the, in the jungle as an animal or whatever. I mean, we do have these very strong prime, primeval or primal or whatever they are instincts uh, for survival. But I think the more you shift that towards wanting to help other people, um, the more it helps, wh- whether, it, whether it helps in any sort of a, uh, empirical way or whether it just softens you because it allows you not to clench so much and, and just think, oh my God, are they going to think I'm smart? Yeah. That's something I do consistently. I mean, literally on my way as I was driving from home towards my office where I'm doing this interview, I'm thinking about that and like, let, you know, let this in some way be a force for good. Well, I think it has been. I, I think we've definitely touched on the uh, wiser and happier part. And I think uh, I think it will probably generate richness for people, too. Uh, yeah, I so mean, how, I mean, rich. <laughs> well, how's it has it been? You know, how's the book going? Is it still like what, what are book sales like? I would assume that you have a big first push and then, uh, you know, I, I don't know how the what the cadence looks like, but what's the tale like? The book has done really solidly and pretty consistently well, thank God. And and one thing, one thing that's been, I, well, one one way I measure it is I think it's been translated into more than twenty languages. So that's really cool. That's cool. Um, and some of them are really wonderfully unlikely languages. So I love the fact that it's it's not only going to be in you know whatever German and French and Spanish and the like and and. Mandarin and whatever, but three different Indian dialects, which when you look at them, you realize there are more people who speak those dialects than who speak most other languages in the world. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So Gujarati and Maharashtra and, and Hindi, I think it's being translated into. And then things like Estonian and Thai. Huh. And, and so there's something really wonderful about that. That, that gives me a great sense of joy. And I, and I continue to get letters from people or emails from people or messages on my website or Twitter or LinkedIn from people saying that it's had a powerful effect on them. So, so that's, um, that's really lovely. That's a, that's a very joyful experience. And then there's a part of me that I look and I'm like, why has Morgan Housel's book been so much more successful? And I look at that and I'm like, ah, jealousy, my old friend, <laughs> or resentment or self-pity or a sense of inadequacy. And I look at it and I'm like, oh yeah, that too. Still got it. Still got those beautiful monsters. And so, so there is a part of me that um, wishes that I were, um, you know, a, a number one international bestseller. And, uh, and again, it's a reminder of my own, my own mediocrity and uselessness. And, and, then, and, then, and then I have to pick myself up again and remind myself, Nah, it's all good. Stop feeling so sorry for yourself and just be grateful for the fact that, you know, you get these opportunities. And so, but so, so it's a, so writing a book brings up a lot of stuff. It brings up a sense of um, your exposure to possible criticism, your vulnerability, your inadequacy. Um, and if there's one thing, when, when I look back, I mean, I, I, I missed my deadline by about two years because I was so obsessively perfectionist about it. And when I look back, th- there was a lot of pressure along the way that came with that decision where I just decided I'm just going to make this book as good as I possibly can and to hell with everything else. I, I, you know, if it's not lucrative because I spend so much time on it, fine. I'm just committed to quality. If it drives my editor nuts, I'm really sorry. I hope he doesn't cancel my contract but I'm just going to make it as high quality as I can. And when I look back now, I'm so glad that I made that commitment to make the book as good as I could possibly make it. And so I don't really have any regrets where I look at something and I say, God, I wish I'd just taken more time over that. It's like, boy, did I take a lot of time. And so, so if there are failings, um, it's not for one of effort. And, and yeah. at that point, I think I spent about five or six months just on the chapter on Nick's sleep and case Sicaria. And at one point when I was feeling kind of incredibly vulnerable about how ridiculously long I was spending on it, how obsessive I was about trying to get everything perfect, I sent him an email and kind of let him know what was going on. 
And I said, you know, I'm not really doing anything else. I'm just kind of quietly in this tunnel, just working away at this thing and just ignoring the rest of the world. And he, he wrote me back a lovely email that said something about how that obsessive pursuit of quality. He said, that, that's, that's where all of the, the, the peace and satisfaction lies. And I took that really seriously. Like, as, as, I, as I write in that chapter, like Nick and Zach were obsessed with Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and with particularly this idea of quality that the author, Persig, talks about. And I do think focusing obsessively on quality um, to the best of our ability, I, I have more and more faith in that as a path. And so again, with my podcast, I'm like, there are so many people pumping out so much crap let me try to do something that's as good as I can possibly make it. And so, so, so that's the one thing I look back on where I don't, I don't really have control over the sales. I don't have control over the fact that, you know, but most of the reviews on Amazon and stuff are good, but someone posted something last week that he gave a one-star review, which I think I've only had a handful of one-star reviews out of two or 3,000. I've gotten some of those. But he literally, one-star review, and he said, terrible. This could, book could be whittled down to a hundred pages. And I, I was saying to my wife, yeah, that's probably true. Maybe a page. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> you, you, are, you are exposed and you're vulnerable and it gives you a way to, to, to face a lot of your beautiful monsters. But, but the basic idea, if I'm trying not just to be self-referential, I, I think going big on a commitment to quality in a world that's committed to pumping out a lot of stuff that then people look at later and they say, yeah, that wasn't my best work. Um, I'm, I'm not sure the world needs a whole lot more of that. And yeah. So I would just encourage people to go big, to, to, to go big on quality in whatever way that resonates for you. And it's not possible at certain times in your life. Like when I was editing a weekly magazine, there were times where, you know, uh, I would say we, uh, to, to quote English soccer, commentators we won ugly you know it was like you yeah. won ugly with a gold in the last minute you know that probably should have been disallowed but you won ugly there are times to win ugly but but i think when you have an opportunity to create something that's true beautiful and good as a friend of mine would say you really you really want to go big on it i could not agree more i actually think that that's a great place to close the conversation but but i want to say uh, I, I do think that we are on parallel journeys and I look forward to many more years being on the journey with you because uh, I, I think you're a super special guy. I love talking to you and uh, I hope that everyone that heard this that hasn't bought your book yet goes out and buys the book. We're coming for Morgan Housel. Morgan, if you're listening, know that we're coming for you. And, uh, you know, thank you for your time. Thank you. And in, in, in confessing my, my sense of inferiority to Morgan, I, I'm trying just to uh, to make peace with my my beautiful monster so that finally I can just look at it and say, it's okay, Morgan's better than you. <laughs> I don't know about better, but uh, here's, here's to, uh, you know, saying hi to the beautiful monsters. And uh, thanks again. I appreciate uh, it. Thank you. It's been a real delight. Bye.